Tricol, Steve Green here, the human power recumbent adventurer. <laughs> anyway, today, well this month actually, it's December, almost the middle of December 2021. And it was 13 years ago this month that I sold my final petroleum powered vehicle and I decided to get into human power. 13 years. And that led to these recumbent tadpole tricycles. Two wheels in the front, one in the back. And my goal was to reduce my carbon footprint. And I still wanted to visit my mom and sister who live in Southern California. And that's close to a thousand miles from where I live. I think it's about 985 miles or something like that. According to my calculations, depending on which route you take. And so mom was all worried. Oh, I'm never gonna see you again. She wanted to buy me a Harley. <laughs> but anyway, I said, mom, I'll still come down and visit you, but it'll just take me a little longer to get there because I'm gonna look for a human powered vehicle of some kind that I can power myself down to your house. And it, it turned out to be like about two and a half, three week trips to go down there. But anyway, I initially wanted a quad, four wheels. And uh, I ended up with a trike instead, three wheels, which I'm glad I did. A fella here in town had a 2007 Ice QNT narrow track trike for sale at 1800 bucks. So I snapped it up and I started outfitting that for my first trip in 2009 down to mom and sister's house in Southern California in the Southern Mojave Desert. And I, of course that was the first trip. So basically what I want to cover today is the thoughts that go through the head of a triker who would like to take an adventure of uh, considerable duration on a trike, human powered trike. And so of course, I think it is with most people, certainly was with me that there's all these fear demons running around inside here. Like, oh man, what's gonna happen? You're gonna get a flat tire. You're gonna be accosted by criminals. You're gonna be attacked by an animal. Your trike is gonna break down in the middle of nowhere. The weather's gonna come in. Uh, you'll be snowed in. You'll, there'll be a flash flood somewhere in those mountains and it'll take you out and bury you under rubble. I mean, you're thinking all these things. And so, I think that's, I think that's uh, pretty common. I originally wanted to have a four wheel and I was thinking about designing some kind of a rack that went up and had a sleeping quarter on top up here. <laughs> so I would sleep up there. I also thought about, uh, I had seen online a trailer that you pull, a custom made thing a guy did that uh, you could sleep in that. So I'm thinking all these things. In fact, my friend, uh, Glenn Aldrich, my old triking buddy up in uh, Canada, is going to be making one of these uh, sleep trailers that he pulls behind him. It expands the length, so when you sleep, there's room for your legs. It's a pretty cool idea he's coming up with, so I'll be uh, featuring that on Trike Asylum. But, that didn't come to pass. What I ended up doing is I get I got a tent and I decided to pull a trailer. I thought I would need a trailer and I'll put a picture. I had a big giant Rubbermaid tub that I put on a burly flatbed trailer. And I, I filled that thing with food and every conceivable thing. I wanted to be ready for anything out there. Anything, you know. I wanted to have two, I wanted to be able to survive two weeks out of my panniers and my trailer, if necessary. That was my idea. That was what I was preparing for in my head. 
I remember on that ice strike, I got it in May of 2009. <clears throat> I uh, headed out in uh, the 1st of October, 2009, the same year. So I, I was riding it around from May to October uh, on uh, just to kind of get the feel for it, going up steep mountains around here, pulling my trailer, which for me was a huge mistake as it turned out. <clears throat> but what I did too, <laughs> I took some of my uh, dumbbells that I have in my weight plates and I loaded the trailer up with these things to simulate a load. I'd, I'd go up uh, Pacific Coast Highway up some of these steep uh, grades up to the lighthouse and stuff and pulling that trailer and, uh, you know, to, to make myself strong for the trip. Um, I'd never done it before. I didn't know what to expect. I'm, you know, I'm pretty strong anyway because I, I work out on a regular basis, but uh, I just wanted to cover all the bases. So I was pulling dumbbells and barbells around in a trailer, training and going for these long rides. And uh, it, it was kind of kind of funny actually. And uh, I, I bought a, a full face motorcycle helmet too, which we'll say that's great for uh, really cold weather, but it's a motorcycle helmet where you're not doing any exercise on a motorcycle. You're just passively sitting there so you don't work up a sweat. But, I took one 50 mile ride one day uh, down the coast and back, and I quickly found out, it was on a, just a normal temperature day, I quickly found out that a full face motorcycle helmet wasn't gonna work because it was trapping all my head heat. You lose 25, 50% of your heat out of your head. So <clears throat> your feet are cold, put on a hat. But, so that thing was, tr that motorcycle helmet I, I got rid of that uh, forthwith and went to a typical bicycle helmet with all the vents. I since got a full face Bell uh, cycling helmet. I love helmets. I've been wearing those since I was just a little kid, uh, riding on motorcycles with my dad. For me, putting on a helmet was like part of uh, putting on your armor or whatever to get ready for this the thing you were gonna do. So I love helmets. You know, I have no problem with it. But the, my full face, my new bell that I got when I had my recumbent uh, bicycle um, several months ago, um, it has a lot of vents in it, so it doesn't heat up. But anyway, that aside, so I, th I would say, you know, I gave a talk uh, not long ago about how do you prepare for a human-powered adventure out on the road. Well, I'm in excellent physical condition. I have been my entire life. I take my health and fitness and longevity very seriously. So it really doesn't take much training. I mean, after that first trip, for my subsequent trips, I didn't do any special training. I did nothing, you know, because, I mean, like, right now, I could just go pedal down to mom's right now without any physical training. It's, it's just uh, something I can do. Now, but for people who are, you know, have health issues or are not a healthy body weight or whatever, you might want to uh, consider some physical preparation in addition to the mental. For me, the most difficult, challenging part of that first trip is overcoming the mental fears, because you don't know what's out there. I was going to be riding through three states, you know, Oregon, California, Nevada, and back into California again. And so I didn't know what to expect. You know, I, for years I've driven all these roads and everything, but on a tricycle, under my own power, you know, it, the only thing that was power in that trike going to be my legs, <laughs> my physical body, my conditioning, and the food I ate. That's, that's how you power up a, a human-powered vehicle. It, it's powered on food. So like I say, you know, I had that big trailer tub that I still have over here under the bench, and I'll, I think I've already put a picture of that up in this video. 
And I loaded that with a whole lot of food. I had a big duffel bag about this long, about that big around, you know, loaded with food. It was heavy. And as it turns out, yeah, I had plenty of food, but as it turns out, I really didn't need to do that because there are, there are little ma and pa markets, even out in the middle of nowhere, you can find a market here or there um, and, and stock up. I think that I was, my rolling weight that first year, based on these fears of the unknown, was about 375 pounds. The rolling weight is the trike, the panniers, the trailer, me, my body weight, everything. Everything that I'm pushing down the road with my power, my human power legs, that's called rolling weight. So it includes the rider. My rolling weight was about 375 pounds. And let me tell you, you know, if you're going out on the flat or going downhill, <laughs> it's nothing. Because once you get rolling on the flat, it, it's, it's, you can, you can maintain. But going up hills takes forever. I, I had to cross the Cascade Range and some other mountain ranges in part of the Eastern Sierra. And so going up hills, it took a long time. And I kind of think in my head that uh, I was burning more calories getting this 375 pound rolling load up these passes than I was carrying in food to replenish those calories. You know, it's just like if a, if a fox is hungry in the winter and chases down a rabbit and, uh, you know, the rabbit, say, provides uh, uh, 4,000 calories, but let's say the chase in the snow, the fox was tired anyway, required 4,500 calories to catch the rabbit in the first place, well, that's, five, that's a 500 calorie caloric uh, deficit. And so you have to measure all that stuff out. I also found that with a trailer uh, maneuvering the trike in tight spots, uh, camping off down the side of the road, because a lot of times on my trips, I don't camp in campgrounds. On the Pacific Coast I do because there's campgrounds everywhere. You have uh, hiker, biker, um, campsites and campgrounds, they only cost eight bucks warm shower, it's great, there's food every place. But um, on my inland trips over the mountain ranges, um, you know, there's, there's not a lot out there and I would camp off the side of the road. I'd be going down Highway 97, for example, or 395 and it's starting to get dark. I try to find a place to pitch a tent about an hour before it starts getting dark and or cold, depending on where you are. If you're in the mountains, it can get mighty cold. And um, there's not always a convenient spot. Some, a lot of times I would just camp by the side of the road in a big giant pullout out in the middle of no place, the boondocks. Sometimes I've gone down on uh, old dirt roads off the side of the uh, highway or whatever and pitched there. <clears throat> and if you have a trailer, it gets really, really hard to do that. Plus, if you go into a parking lot to park or something, backing up a trailer on it, that's, that's no fun either, T turning the trike around or whatever. But anyway, so those, those are some of the ideas. You know, I mean, I, I have since learned after that trip, I immediately put my Burley uh, Nomad flatbed trailer, um, I don't know if it's called a Nomad, but it's a flatbed. I put it up for sale, sold it to some lady who happened to be up in Oregon. She was from California. She just wanted it for running errands on her trike. Great for that, but it didn't suit me. And I, I kept the tub in the tub over there under the bench. I just uh, keep miscellaneous stuff like old helmets, uh, other trikey stuff that I don't use all the time, shoes or whatever. So the biggest thing for me, and probably anybody on going on your first overland tricycle adventure is it's psychological. That's, that's what you have to master to do this. It's darn hard when you think, well, I'm going to be out on the road for, say, like, in my case, it was 
you know, look at it three weeks. And you don't know where you're going to sleep at night. And that's a big one right there. Where am I going to sleep at night? So unless you're going down the coast where there's plenty of uh, markets, restaurants, motels, and all that kind of campgrounds, unless you're doing that, this where am I going to uh, sleep at night is a, is a big thing. When you're going down the coast, it's no big deal. <laughs> you know that a day's ride, less than a day's ride from where you are when you get up in the morning, there's going to be another campground. So you break down your tent, you just ride to that next campground. That's, that's pretty straightforward and simple. But when you really get out there um, where there are, all those conveniences don't exist, like which is my inland route, which I've uh, ridden more times. I only have ridden the Pacific Coast once. Um, and not only is it harder because of the, the steep hills and mountains, believe it or not, because there's some steep all of a sudden, steep grades. I mean, you, it just you better have a little gearing on that. But when you when you go inland, um, and you try to you try to avoid big cities and towns, you're just looking for a rural route, which is what I was doing. I wanted to avoid big cities and towns. I just wanted to ride out in the country and enjoy the ride. Well, when you do that, you pick these routes. For me, it happened to be the most straightforward route to get down to the southern Mojave Desert. But there's not much out there. One night I, uh, I had just gone through Klamath Falls. I didn't want to camp in the KOA there. I kept riding. But I realized I needed to, to pitch a tent. Sooner or later, I looked at this one parking lot at some uh, college. A lot of bright lights. I said, no, I'm just going to get hassled by the campus police or the town police or something. So further out of town there was this church and there was a car in the parking lot I stopped in. It was a pastor and his wife, co-pastors I guess in this church. I said, hey, do you mind if I uh, pitch a tent out in your lawn? Because they had this beautiful expansive grass lawn next to a horse pasture from some farmer. They said, no, go ahead. And I asked him, <laughs> I said, any sprinklers going to be coming out out there in a timer tonight? <laughs> and they said, no, no, nothing tonight like that. So I pitched out there, you know, so it's just kind of like an, an opportunistic. But I would say when you're out on these uh, overland journeys where you don't have all the niceties of campgrounds and markets, to uh, start looking for a place to pitch your tent at least an hour before sundown. And that's really important because once it starts getting cold, your hands start getting cold, it gets really hard to do things. I remember one, one morning I, I woke up in a tent and uh, it was freezing. So cold he didn't want to get out of the tent and take a pee in the woods because this, this was all very primitive where I was. There was nothing there. I just camped in the woods off the side of the road. But it's so cold, you say, oh, geez, you know, I don't even want to get up and go to the bathroom. But uh, <laughs> I, what, I was, what I would do is I would start getting dressed in my sleeping bag. I, I would wear a, a, a polar fleece skull cap during the night, and I'd be, un, and I'd be up, you know, zipped up in the bag. But then I'd start putting on clothes while I'm in the bag so it was easier. But I remember that morning, I think it was, I found out later it was about 20, 23 degrees out there where I was camped in the woods. And I went to eat a cliff bar, but it was, <laughs> it was like, uh, it was like concrete, you know? Um, couldn't even bite into it. So basically I just packed up the uh, tent stuff and got the track and my trailer, which is really hard to do, back up this 15 uh, to 20 foot incline of uh, loose, loose uh, lava rock and, and dirt back up onto the highway. That was a real pain. I mean, that's when I started realizing, well, oh, these trailers aren't all they're cracked up to be. Plus the night before, I had to turn the trike around in there with the trailer, so I didn't do, had to do these little increments. I mean, turning a trike around by itself is no big deal. You lift it from the back, but uh, with a trailer, yeah, it is a big deal. 
So I just uh, I just packed it up since it was it was too cold to eat. When you you know when your fingers are freezing and your water is ice cold and your food is frozen, it, it doesn't do much for your appetite. So I just rode on down the road an hour down uh, Highway 97 and uh, ended up there was a a wayside for an old logging camp and I pulled in there and by then the sun was hitting this. I had this one big giant redwood uh, uh, picnic table and I it was being bathed in the morning sun and it just felt great so I just had a breakfast there but when you're going on a, a true human powered recumbent adventure self-supported that's something else I didn't mention earlier I was just basically self-supported I did not have any backup I don't have backups on my trips I'm just out there by myself and so, you know, when you're doing that, you become an opportunist. You eat what you can, when you can, you, uh, you do what you can, when you can, you know. Uh, where you pitch the tent each night, it's not always I ideal, but sometimes you don't have any choice. I have even slept on uh, my trike before, on, I don't know, two or three occasions. It's, it's not all that great, you know, you put on all the clothes you have, you have a space blanket at one time uh, at the north end of the Golden Gate Bridge on the Pacific Coast run, I, uh, I had to uh, camp, but I couldn't pitch a tent because I was on the road that was leading up, doing up to the Golden Gate Bridge, San Francisco there, so I just sat on the trike and I figured, well, if a cop comes by, which the cop did later, <laughs> uh, I'm, only, I'm just sitting on my tricycle. They might have a, an ordinance against camping, which some places do, but if you're just sitting on your tricycle, what are they going to do? <laughs> so that's what I did that night, and it gets really cold, you know, all you're doing is wishing for morning. One time I was doing that um, in the foothills of the Cascade Mountains in Oregon, and uh, I don't know, somewhere around midnight, I was getting too cold. I had everything on. I was getting too cold just sitting on the trike. So I said, you know what? I might as well be pedaling. So that's what I did. I hadn't set up a, you know, I was just sitting on the trike, sleeping on the trike or trying to. It doesn't work very well when you're cold. So I started pedaling. I got plenty warm, plenty fast. And I just pedaled through the night. Had my headlight and stuff on like that. But 